Um, so we will move on to Eric um, now. Um, Eric um, uh, studied philosophy and religion at the Graduate Theological Union in UC Berkeley. He's taught the history of Egyptian, Indian, Greek, Chinese, Islamic, and European thought for many years. And he also studies the relationship of meaning to Carol's fantasies, posed detective stories, and Wittgenstein's thought experiments. Um, today, Eric is going to speak to us about Alice and the order of Aristotle's categories. Um, and uh, I hope Eric is ready to go. I am. Can everybody hear me? I'm doing okay. You're sounding great. Okay, good. Well, uh, if it's my time here. Uh, hey, everybody. Hope you guys are all doing good. Um, I'm Eric Gerlach, uh, and I am going to give a talk on the comparisons and parallels of, Alice, of Aristotle's works on logic, as well as a tiny bit on ethics, and uh, the works and the famous fictions of Lewis Carroll. So um, I have provided uh, to USC and the Carroll Society a list of, um, I have many lectures on my website uh, about logic, but I've created a shorter playlist that I've shared with the society about Aristotle, Mill, Bull, De Morgan, making comparisons with Lewis Carroll's work that I don't have time to make in this talk. But I will simply read this talk uh, verbatim while making an aside or two. So in this talk, I will present the best evidence of substance, only the best and sweetest of butter, that suggests Wonderland and the Looking Glass can teach children Aristotle's 10 logical categories from lowest to highest, the way a passionate child would look upward to adults of substance and that the snark hunt following Alice's adventures is likely a logic problem, like those Carol posed in his works on logic, solved by finding a category of Aristotle for each of the 10 hunters. I will end with an outline of my theory that Carol's three famous fantasies, Alice, Alice, and snark, teach three of the most basic ideas of Aristotle's logic and ethics, the lessons one would teach a child with il illustrations and memorable examples. First, the 10 logical categories, the central idea of Aristotle's first book on logic, the categories, in the order Aristotle himself lists them, but backwards, as if in a mirror. They fit well, very well, with the order of events and characters of both books, chapter by chapter, mixed up in the middle, but I will explain, and I do believe that folks will be able to see it. Second, the four forms of proposition, the central idea of Aristotle's second book on logic, on interpretation, and also the idea of Aristotle central to modern logic, Boole, De Morgan, and Carroll's own work on logic, Carroll's puzzling syllogisms, and his game of logic, the board game he invented to teach children these same four forms, fit well with the four royal court characters of each of Alice's adventures. Third and finally, balance between extremes, the central lesson of Aristotle's ethics, which is most captured in the Nicomachean ethics, and the use Aristotle makes of the colors red, white, and black in his work on logic. The same books I am talking about fit well with the way Carroll consistently uses these three colors along with gold. I am not aware of Aristotle using gold much, but gold would be the golden rule, the golden mean, and balance. With all of this, I hope others see more and that my theories lead to others. Again, I am happy to hear suggestions, and I do know that this could be quite controversial to give such an overhaul uh, plotting here of Aristotle amidst the text, but I will present the best evidence of that, and I am primarily going to be presenting evidence of the categories, as was my article for the Society, but I will fit in uh, just a brief outline of how the four forms of proposition and balance be between extremes also fit so well I doubt it is a coincidence. So to begin here with Wonderland, Duns Scotus and William of Ockham, who are almost as ancient as Oxford and European universities, uh, are the two most famous Neoplatonic philosophers and logicians of early Oxford, who wrote commentaries on Aristotle's logic and ethics and taught logic centuries before Carroll and his peers followed in their shadow. Unlike these early Oxford alums, modern philosophers and logicians, including Kant, Mill, De Morgan, and Boole, have entirely ignored Aristotle's 10 types of beings as bygone cosmology, gone with Newton, pre-Einstein. It is not clear whether Aristotle intended the text to be a complete closed system or open general discussion. But in the text, he lists in the beginning and then proceeds to explain a bit 10 categories of truth, 10 types of things we say about things. And those are substance, the material being of this or that thing, quantity, the number or amount of a thing, quality, an aspect of a thing such as good or green, 
Relations, the interaction of a thing with others. Space, the place a thing it is in and occupies. Time, the duration of a thing and the thing it involves. Position, the situation of a thing with other things. State, the current status of a thing in terms of itself. Action, what a thing does to itself or other things. And finally, passion, the lowliest, what moves a living thing to this or that action. Aristotle discusses substance first, the basis of truth and being itself, and proceeds only somewhat in his own stated order to illustrate many but not all of the ten, leaving the last few, including lowly passion, largely unillustrated. Aristotle says, quote, of the rest, that is time, place, and state, they are so clear that I need say no more than I said at the very beginning, end quote. It may be Carroll found further illustrations necessary and put them in the hands of children. If we turn Aristotle's own list of categories backwards, starting with the lowest rather than the highest. I have to say, thank you for the last presentation. Uh, Diane, certainly having children sit still for, uh, for photographs, temperance over time for children and backwards images fits photography very well, which he was also doing this whole time. And I do not say much about photography here, but that presentation uh, fits very well um, with what I'm saying, in fact. So if we turn this all backwards, we have as the list, like the Jabberwock text backwards in the looking glass, which he may have put there to signify what he had already done in Wonderland. We have passion, action, state, position, time, space, relations, quality, quantity, and substance. This inverted list fits the order of events and characters Alice encounters in both of her adventures with the two books mirroring each other chapter by chapter so well that it can be argued Carol intended to teach children lessons about logic whether or not they knew how they were being trained during play. In Wonderland, the first adventure fitted to Aristotle's inverted list. The white rabbit is passion, the mouse is action, the dodo is state, the rabbit's house is position, the caterpillar is time, the Cheshire cat is space, the duchess is relations, the mad tea party is quality, poor quality. The queen's garden is quantity, and the king's trial is substance. Space shares space with a chapter with relations in the middle. The most confusing part of my theory, but it does make simple sense. The Cheshire Cat in the House of the Duchess and the last few chapters are about substance or lack thereof, from the lying mock turtle to the trial of tarts. I am going to now give evidence from Wonderland, and then I will talk about the parallels with Looking Glass and go through Looking Glass, which will be the bulk of this talk. As Wonderland opens, all in the golden afternoon, a golden mean between day and night, Alice is full of passion, but frustrated in many ways, bored as she wants to join in something with her sister, but uninterested in a book without pictures or conversations. She considers weaving a white daisy chain as the white rabbit runs by, worried and late. Passion bonds us, and Aristotle said we share passion with beasts, but we use language and logic, which is why Alice is amazed by the strange, absurd conjunction of the rabbit. Alice follows burning with curiosity without a thought of how to get back. The hole dips and she falls in without time to think as she is so passionate. It is too dark to see, as in passion, but she falls past diagrams, maps, and containers empty of substance, such as a jar without marmalade, which is desirable but contents absent. Passion without substance. Just as when you take a bone from a dog, as the Queen's test Alice in the second tale, the temper remains. As she falls, Alice worries about killing someone below, worries what opposite others will think, and worries her cat will miss her. Alice thinks of Dinah, her cat, asks herself if cats eat bats, and then if bats eat cats. She follows the rabbit into a frustrating hall of locked doors and can't solve the problem of the golden key, which sits on a three-legged table. Like the golden goal of ethics, balanced on a syllogistic three-legged logic. She cries and demands she stop crying this minute with not yet patience for herself and too passionate to follow her own advice. In the next chapter, Alice, and it's chapter break, chapter break, and you can see words that correspond with each category as the chapters break. Although they are intermingling, and you can see it, the categories intermingling, as Aristotle says it does, at the edges. In the next chapter, Alice struggles with action in many ways as she meets the mouse. She considers the useless action <clears throat> of sending Christmas presents to her feet. So does Wittgenstein. I have much to say about that. I can't. She can't remember who she is, so she tries to act as others can't. But instead of reciting a piece, an action, about a busy bee storing up activity, the poem warps into a crocodile welcoming fish swimming into its jaws. Alice says she won't return if others want her back, but then cries and wishes they would come find her. She falls into her tears, enveloped further by her passion, but sees a mouse swimming in her own hopeless situation, acting where she is simply passionate, and speaks to him of cats and dogs, expressing her passion but not thinking of his, so he reacts and swims away. 
Aristotle's examples of action are burning and cutting, and the mouse burning emotionally keeps cutting on Alice without a word, a pun that Carol himself uses in the Queen's Banquet in the end, cutting, as in not talking to someone and leaving. She calls out again with concern and he reacts, turns back and swims to her, reacting and acting. They agree to swim the shore together, joined by many others who follow their actions swimming in their wake, action leading to the actions of others. Chapter break, in the next chapter, reaching a steady state on the shore, we are told, the party assembles on the bank and Alice feels she has known them all her life. She would if they're her nation and people. The mouse tells a dry tale about William the Conqueror, the original, you know, Brit. Uh, Alice isn't dried by the stately story and the dodo solemn, solemnly moves to adjourn the meeting and adopt another motion. They run the caucus race in a circle without explaining what they are doing and the dodo says the shape doesn't matter as if nations all behaves, behave the same as if they're all piles of people. The dodo decrees everyone has won and all get prizes Alice has to pay for out of her own pocket. The dodo symbolically and thimbolically gives her a thimble, a formality that has no effect like giving gifts to one's feet. Adding death to taxes, the mouse recites a poem about a dog who is judge, jury, and executioner, all the positions of state justice to explain why he fears larger creatures like the state. Alice frightens the animals off, but some make polite excuses, cutting also with excuses. In the next chapter, the rabbit returns, still worried about superiors of higher position and mistakes Alice for his subordinate servant, Marianne of lower position, ordering her into his house to fetch his things. She accepts the order and fills his entire house, occupying the entire position available. Aristotle's example of position includes sitting and lying down and says we can't do both at once. There is a lot in Alice in Wonderland that seems to contradict Aristotle on purpose. Alice appears to do both at once, uncomfortably. Alice considers how much her position has changed and thinks her story should be put in a book, the position she is in for us. She wonders if she will ever be in the position of an old woman and hates the thought of remaining in the position of a child with lessons forever. The rabbit calls for Bill the lizard, his lowly servant to digging for apples, trying to find something of value in too low a place, just like his master does with him, as Bill fails to eject Alice after they position him on top of the house with ladders lashed together. Alice says she wouldn't want to be in Bill's position, shrinks and runs into the woods where she finds herself in the opposite position, scared of a monstrous happy puppy. She looks up above the mushroom, the position above her, and finds the caterpillar in, uh, in such a position. Chapter break. In the first words of the next chapter, the caterpillar and Alice look at each other for some time in silence. He asks her who she is, and she says she knew this morning but has changed so much since then. The caterpillar asks again who she is and circles back to where they started, like the hookah and the smoke circling over his head. Alice says he ought to say who he is first, turns to leave, but he asks her to return and keep her temper. This is a critical moment in my reading of this story. She does, like a child sitting for photographs, actually. She does and swallows her anger and waits several minutes, like a photograph, actually, for him to speak. He asks her to speak instead, tre treading more on her patience, and to recite Old Father William, a poem about an elder who says he looked to the future and gives wisdom to the young. But Alice's strange father, William, is a fat fool who stands on his head, argues with his wife, balances eels on his nose, and tries to sell the youth medicinal oils, which shows he has learned nothing over the course of his life is not wise. The caterpillar tells her it is wrong from beginning to end, the entire duration in time. Alice patiently waits for him to say something as he leaves and the caterpillar rewards her with the mushroom, which is why this is a critical moment that when she pauses, she gets the reward that will solve her syllogistic problem, that it will solve her problems of size with the golden key. But that is after talking to a cat in a tree. And increasingly as I'm composing this talk, I did not realize the cat really resembles the evil side of the key perched in the tree, but I will leave that off. He is the other side of the key and sees both sides. It's a bit more golden though to just have it in one key. Alice meets an impatient pigeon, impatient pigeon in the same chapter as the caterpillar, defending its young and has no time, the pigeon says, to hatch eggs, watch for serpents and get sleep since the highest tree, no position, in the woods is not safe. The pigeon is impatient, unlike Alice, and an example opposite the caterpillar. Alice, patient with the pigeon, she shows her patience and, dis and dis <laughs> she shows that she is patient in this chapter, and she makes the uh, she feels for her because she is patient. She has 
empathy. And she says she is young too, but eats eggs. The pigeon makes the hasty, untempered judgment that little girls are some kind of serpent and has no time to relate further or to feel for little girls. In the next chapter, Alice watches space get intertangled with relations. Now, this is the most confusing part because space is intertangled with something in another chapter as a chapter in each tale. So that is the most confusing part. And I imagine people might have most issue with that. But right at the point where it gets entangled, we see the frog and the, and the fish get entangled in their wigs. And in the next story, the sheep entangles too much with knitting needles, right at the point where this should all get entangled. And it makes sense because space is space. So it's already there. In the next chapter, Alice watches space get in, in, intertangled in relations as the queen's fish footman from the larger sea, larger space, Tangle's wigs is interrelated with the duchess's frog footman of the smaller pond. Inside the house is the Cheshire cat. That would be the queen and the duchess, larger and smaller uh, sea and pond. In, uh, inside the house is the Cheshire cat who speaks of this way or that way as he does after, of course, in space. And the Duchess abuse, but we see the Cheshire Cat first, before actually, and so he actually is space just ahead of time, but he is mixed up with her. That the Duchess, abuseful and neglectful, is in charge, but terrible at relations, which pretty much characterizes her. The Cat and the Duchess share the same chapter without speaking to each other. Only one of them speaks at a time. The sharp-chinned Duchess is divisive, thinks her baby sneezes to displease her, and gives no glance to the cook who fills her house with pepper and throws everything but the sink. Later, the Duchess fears the Queen, but boxes her ears and gets arrested. In the categories, discussing relations, Aristotle says beauty might not be endlessly relative as something could exist that nothing is uglier. Unfortunately, and I forget the historical figure, the illustration of the Duchess is such a portrait. When Alice takes the baby outside, it turns into an ugly pig, and Alice relates to it differently, abandoning it in the woods, bad at relations herself, in an interesting twist. The Cheshire Cat in the same chapter now appears in a tree, enticing and intimidating, the side Alice loves and the side of the cat the mouse fears, like a baby or a pig, depending on which space or branch we sit. The cat cares as little where Alice goes in space, he tells her this, as the caterpillar cares how much she changes in time. It is actually in, first thing you know, the caterpillar is time, and then the cat is space, but I got to all of this, because I suddenly realized the Cheshire cat is space to the caterpillar's time. That becomes increasingly clear when you look at it this way. So both have lessons for Alice. The two critical characters in Alice in Wonderland are the caterpillar teaching Alice patience, and the cat teaching her perspective, time and space, which are both critical for development and perspective over time with others. So the at Oxford, Carol missed his family in Cheshire. Some compare himself and uh, Carol to the Cheshire cat. So in part, some part of him was there at home while the rest of him was elsewhere at Oxford. He was in multiple places at once. The cat translocates without moving and partially appears which signifies space, both of it, just as we only uh, see part of space at any given time. In the illustration of the cat's grinning head above the argument in the queen's garden, he seems both figure and ground, the overall and particular positions, which is why he grins at their argument, the evil side of the key. The cat implies we are all insane to others who face or go the opposite way, each in our own own place, in our own place, and all bad at relations. He vanishes, the cat, but returns twice, First to ask what happened to the baby and then ask if she said pig or fig, which I am pretty sure shows he is forgetful. I cannot make sense of that other than he is forgetful, which shows he is master of space, but not time. He is not everywhere in time, but he is in space, which is how he forgets her uh, what she said. Aristotle says that madness can exist without sanity and that Socrates, he, uh, Aristotle likes to use Socrates as his example in his logical works, can't be sick and healthy at the same time, which for Aristotle right there means sane and insane at the same time. But this is entirely contradicted by the Cheshire cat, whose point is entirely opposite Aristotle's, as we and Socrates are all insane and sane, depending on placement and relations with others, which is the chapter we are in. In the categories, Aristotle explain, uh, Aristotle's examples of poor quality, next, are rudeness and madness. 
and in the next chapter, both are on full display at the tea party. The Hare and Hatter lean on the Dormouse as he sleeps. I do believe there's more here with Boole and the fact that Boole is separate from his animal self and abstract with logic because of the dream in the middle. But I don't have enough time to get into that right here. And you can see my talk on Boole for more of the connections with the white rabbit, white people actually, and the considerations Carol and Boole are making about categories of people, beasts, et cetera, because there's more there that's quite interesting, especially because the Hatter and Hare are a person and beast divided, but the white rabbit in the beginning is both of them conjoined. I think the white rabbit is mocking Aristotle and the mad tea party is mocking Bool. I think that is actually quite clear, but I'm not going to talk about any of that here. I have other stuff in my other talks. Please see those. So they tell Alice, very rude, and they cannot develop because they don't speak the time. They can't develop temperance. They tell Alice there is no room for her at the table and return her insistence with rude remarks, the hare uncivilly offering her non-existent wine and the hatter suggesting a haircut, which Alice says is too personal. The hatter asks her a riddle with no answer and the party baselessly claim Alice doesn't say what she means. I have studied that extensively. I have a lot to say about that. Can't say it here. But each substitution they give goes further and further from what she meant in the particular moment, which means they are too abstract and not grounded. The hare uses the best butter, but the hatter's watch is still broken as the best in quality isn't best if poorly used. Poor and best being quality. And those are examples of Aristotle. And time stands still for them, so neither improve. The Hatter says perhaps Alice hasn't spoken to time, but she has, if the Caterpillar himself is time, and none of them would know it. It's actually quite awesome if the Caterpillar is time, because actually they're all ignorant here, and we all, I suppose, could be. The party doesn't consider the future when they're fully around the table. They're not thinking in time, and would rather listen to the Dormouse's story about sisters who are sick and stuck in a well similar to their own situation. Alice leaves what she says is the stupidest, worst tea party ever. That would mean poorest in quality. In the next chapter, now that Alice has learned patience from time and perspective, from space and survived the timeless tea party that goes round and round and nowhere, she solves the banquet hall, uses the golden key on the table that resembles the form of a logical syllogism and finds not Eden, but quantities, numbered playing cards, painting white roses red, the two, five, and seven of spades. Two gets between five and seven in an argument, and they fall on their faces as the rest of the pack march by in pairs, followed by royalty, all by class. Neither the queen nor knave know who Alice is, and she has neither number nor class. The knave smiles silently so he won't lose his head, and the queen casually tosses hers, I didn't notice that pun until later, much as she would his. Alice reassures herself they're all merely symbolic like figureheads of state the, and also numbers, which are symbols. The queen calls for Alice's head. Alice contradicts her and nothing happens materially. If these are all ideas and symbols. To the queen, her cards are completely dispensable, forms without individuality. So, so she is giddy when they bow up and down as Alice was with the Cheshire Cat because their numbers and classes are disappearing and that's all of them the queen actually can see. Carroll and other logicians of his day were seeking rules and foundations for mathematics and logic, like a lawless croquet game where the equipment doesn't behave and there are no orderly turns, which is also like politics and British history. Alice thinks of escaping the place and what do you know, the Cheshire cat appears, who's place, asking her how she is getting on as he is place in space and can appear there or anywhere he likes. Alice waits for his ears to appear and the others then get into an argument over whether they can behead him before they can resume the game. The executioner says if it doesn't have a body like symbols and forms without content, then it can't be beheaded. But the king insists. The queen says everyone will die if the issue isn't resolved, this sum of everyone. In discussing relations, Aristotle says some animals have no heads and again, the Cheshire Cat entirely contradicts Aristotle with his example of a head with no body. At this point in the next chapter, there should be substance, but it's absent. And Alice and the, du uh, but Alice and the Duchess trade false morals. We learn there are no actual executions and we meet two liars who lack substance. The Griffin, a myth we are told we probably haven't seen, and the Mock Turtle. The Griffin tells Alice the fake turtle's tears are all an act, but then joins in his story and both pretend to sob. He tells her it's a lie. He then joins into it. The mock turtle speaks in a deep, hollow tone. And when Alice points out a tortoise couldn't teach in the sea, the Griffin shames her. 
joining in the mock turtle's lies. The mock turtle says they studied ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision, and they use all four on Alice to keep her distracted. The griffin claims he studied but speaks with a lower class accent, and he covers for the mock turtle when Alice questions how much lesson can lessen. He keeps covering for the other. The pair dance the lobster quadrille. I would like to find more out about the lobster quadrille. Um, there's more there, I think, that has to do with logic and going back and forth between opposites, and I have not figured that out at all to my liking. It has its own chapter also, sits there independently as its own chapter. I actually don't know much of what to make of that other than lump it together with this is all about substance and absence in the end. So they shout and scream with delight, but then they immediately drop their the passion and they just, as they end the dance, which shows it's all an act. They don't actually, they are enjoying it and then they're simply not. Alice tells the two her story so far and they interrupted old father William as curious and backwards as could be to them because they say what they don't mean while Alice didn't say what she meant to say, which is completely backwards to liars. Alice tries, she's creative and uh, as opposed to lying, which is sort of the opposite. Alice tries to create, recite another poem, but speaks of a lobster who talks when the tide is low, but changes his tune when the tide is high, of a panther who feeds on substance and an owl who unfortunately gets the empty dish and then is eaten. The mock turtle speaks of beautiful soup we should buy with no description of what substance goes into it, which sounds like false advertising, like old Father William selling people medicinals. In the next chapter, the griffin takes Alice to the King of Hearts court trial. Now, here is where we go from absence to substance, because the tarts are sitting right there. But they were stolen, and now they're back, which is absence leading to presence and substance. The King of Hearts uh, court trial, uh, Carol holds the interests of children repeatedly throughout all of these with sweet treats such as marmalade, jam, tarts, plum pudding, and bride's cake. I guess he also holds a kid in place with a stick, I guess, you know, as we heard of the last one. Um, the king, like substance itself, includes all useful and useless evidence and testimony. He is overly inclusive. Uh, like substance, includes everything uh, that exists. The large dish of tarts sits in the middle of the court. Alice identifies the king by his wig, which he wears over his crown. One substance sitting uncomfortably on another, sitting uncomfortably on another, which resembles the baker I will get to. Alice grows into a giant as the hatter insists he is a poor man. The hatter and hair are quality, and three times the hatter says, I am a poor man. He is, because he's a poor quality, insane, and rude, as already discussed. Alice says they haven't had any solid substantive evidence or testimony yet, and then is called to the stand as she grows into the largest living substance in the room. <laughs> which would be her evidence and substance. The king orders Alice out of his court, much as Aristotle says, substance can't can sustain contradiction. Central to Aristotle's logic. The rabbit interrupts with a poem empty of direct references, form empty of content, and the king fills it with content and substance, fitting individuals foolishly from his court trial into the form. Because he's substance, he gives it, uh, you know, uh, foolishly and erroneously, substance. The queen wants the sentence before the verdict, the quantity of years of punishment before we know it applies to the actual case because she is quantity. Alice contradicts her, says they're all a pack of cards, abstract categories and ideas, and ends the trial and her dream. She finds herself in the lap of her sister who listens to her and kisses her forehead. Alice shares her dream and her sister dreams. Alice passes the dream from future child to future child. So that, of course, is the best evidence and ignoring everything else of Wonderland that this does indeed line up very well with Aristotle's categories and specifically some in, uh, confused and mixed in the middle. So let us move on here. And I didn't notice the note I am talking rather fast. My apologies. I will try to slow um, down a bit. The uh, looking glass follows. And the Looking Glass, the second adventure of Alice, mirrors Wonderland. It is very clear the two mirror each other, chapter by chapter. I knew that a while ago. I'm sure uh, most did. The first chapter of each of Alice's adventures is about passion, with the white rabbit and the black kitten. The second chapter is about action, with the swimming mouse and the running red queen. In fact, you can see how Carol is actually playing with the categories and turning his earlier examples opposite, but keeping the categories consistent because they're opposite examples, white rabbit, black kitten, butts, and et cetera, swimming mouse, running red queen are very uh, different, but they are both about action. The third chapter is about state with the Dodo's caucus race and the gnat on the public train. The fourth chapter is about position with Alice taking a position in the white rabbit's house and then between lower class Tweedledum and Dee while she's in the Red King's dream. 
The fifth and sixth chapters of each work, and this is the confusing part, are about time, space, and relations interwoven and mixed together, such that the fifth chapter of each book is about time, with the Caterpillar of Wonderland and the White Queen of the Looking Glass. The sixth chapter is about relations, with the Duchess and Humpty Dumpty both terrible at relations, and space, the Cheshire Cat and the White Sheep, does not have its own chapter, its own space as space. Rather, in each book, space is the length and shares a chapter with uh, a chapter in space with others, with relations in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat in the House of the Duchess, who is mentioned before the Duchess, and with time in the looking glass, with the White Queen turning into the sheep. At least the Cheshire Cat is seen before the Duchess. I don't know if the Duchess is heard of first, but the cat is seen by Alice before the Duchess, which places space before relations and fits the list. He does talk after the Duchess though, but I do think that's because Carol couldn't find a way that the cat lectures Alice after the Duchess because his talk after the Duchess tall tells us everything about what the Duchess is doing wrong plenty, of course. So that slightly goes out of order in the first, but it's not entirely because we do hear of him first. But the White Queen herself, if that was confusing in the first, Lewis Carroll has the White Queen herself turn into the sheep in the same chapter, which would very much be time and space as one. This is the most confusing part, but it is the part where the categories themselves are most interwoven. And we see examples of interweaving and intermixing specifically given. The seventh chapter of each work, I'm gonna continue. Uh, this is the overview and I'm gonna to get to the evidence of uh, talking a little slower through uh, looking glass. This is still the comparison, the overview of the mirroring. The seventh chapter of each work is about quality with the underqualified rude mad tea party and the opposite overperforming lion and unicorn. And with the hare and hatter of poor character and quality under and over in both. The eighth chapter is about quantity, with the playing cards of the Queen of Hearts and endless inventions of the White Knight, an innumerable quantity as opposed to the cards. The rem that is, the White Knight does not come up with a certain number of ideas, he comes up with plenty, which is in uh, quantity more or less. In fact, I am, uh, well, yes, uh, more to say about that at some point. The remaining chapters of each work, again, are about substance or absence, with the insubstantial lies of Mock Turtle leading to the King of Hearts trial over stolen but recovered tarts, and the Queen's testing Alice in unnumbered sums, like the dog with the bone, leading to the banquet. So let us, again, quickly, I will speak slow, slowly, slower, perhaps, but... Here is, again, a short rundown of the evidence as just mentioned. In the opening chapter, a chapter of Looking Glass, the black kitten attacks the yarn with passion. Alice threatens and kisses her passionately, and we learn she threatened her nurse as if she was a hyena. Alice fears the world in the mirror might be trying to trick her with a false fire, like those who pretend to have passion but lie and have other motives. The white queen rushes to her screaming baby, so passionate she knocks over the king. Alice laughs at the king's frozen horror and moves the pen of the king, as if she is the passion or genius that directs him, and we hear of the dreaded Jabberwock. In the next chapter, Alice finds a backwards acting corkscrew path, and action is much like the shape of a corkscrew, circling while pushing forward. A circle, if you look at action through the center of it, and linear if you look at action down its length. I do think this is quite brilliant of Carol. A corkscrew, which the Humpty Dumpty comes with a corkscrew trying to act, we don't learn what he does. A corkscrew is used forwards and backwards. Otherwise it is stuck. So Alice goes backwards. The corkscrew path keeps turning Alice back, but she pushes on to flowers that can't move or act as Alice can. So they, they can't act. So they criticize her for being different. Unlike birds and beasts, Alice doesn't lead them, but goes past them because they never act. And so unlike the birds of the first tale that follow, they don't because they can't. It's opposite, but it's still about action or not, which is why they talk a bunch. They say the tree will act for them if there is danger barking, but trees don't bark and so it wouldn't act just as they can't. The Red Queen contradicts and corrects Alice continuously, criticizes everything Alice does, and Alice sees they are all playing chess, which shows her her future course of action set out before her. All of her acts are criticized. Here's the course of action before you negatively and positively. The moment the queen tells Alice she will be a queen herself when she reaches the edge of the board, they both begin running hand in hand. So once she learns the plan, they both begin acting as much as possible. They run as fast as they can to stay in place, like 
one would do to keep action action with biscuits that make matters worse action leading to passion not satisfaction in a settled state a lot of this is the absurdity of categories in the world and how by themselves and not intercomplementary they are not enough in the next chapter the state is reflected by the train which moves in a line rather than a circle like the caucus race notice the caucus race runs in a circle corkscrew this train goes in a line the passengers talk together with slogans like the public mind an insect who tells jokes alice ignores shows her the rich dragonfly who has made a plum pudding and brandy and the poor bread and butterfly the rich and the poor of the state who always fails to find enough and dies like the dodo says the shape doesn't matter turns out again according to cynical carol and with the photograph of again beggar alice the poor always fail to find enough and starve and die. That does seem actually like a slight dig on all the forms of state, yes, and humanity. At least I see it that way. Perhaps, uh, yes, subtle. Names are like titles, like the state, and that is what they live on or don't. They actually live in the way of their names. And the, or they don't, like living by titles. As the gnat sighs himself away, Alice goes from sad puns, double meaning words, to blissfully losing her name in the woods with a fawn, and both forgetting their position, which is the Tweedle Twins' next chapter are now going to show us. Again, we almost have a blissful Edenic state in spite of the train state. And now here comes position. In the next chapter, Alice meets the Tweedles, who offer her opposed positions in logic, contrary-wise, and tell her their longest story of the walrus and carpenter misleading and eating young oysters to keep her out in the woods with them, in their same position. In On Interpretation, Aristotle says, if such things may or may not be, events may or may not take place. And he says, either a coat's ripped or it's not, you know. And it's much like saying, if it was so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. And that's logic. That's Aristotle, very much. And yes, Aristotle actually says words that are quite like that. Carols are, of course, purposefully more entertaining and absurd. Alice calls them first boy and next boy. Those are positions in a classroom, of course, of old, the best and the second best. Dumb says she shouldn't begin this way by giving them high position, but instead should shake hands with them as if they're equals and with a lower class, how do you do? And shake hands, which means she put them in the high position. He's like, nah, just stay out here equal with us, you know? And like they go around and round in a circle together of equal position in a three uh, handed, you know, circle. The brothers hug each other as equals, and Alice finds herself dancing round and round with them all equally holding hands equally in the circle. Now, as their walrus and carpenter opens, the sun is in the moon's position, the middle of the night. The walrus is upper class, and the carpenter is lower class with a paper workman's hat. The oysters do not listen to their elder in senior position and wiser. They stop at a rock conveniently low, so the oysters can listen but also uh, get reached and eaten. The walrus begins with a talk of lowly things, but also kings, low and high. The oysters ask not to be eaten. The walrus asks, do you admire the view, which is distraction with position, like they are trying to do with Alice out in the woods with this story. It's equally and oppositely the case as, uh, well, Alice hears the red king snoring and they tell her that she is only a thing in his dream, which is not entirely true which is equally and oppositely the case as he is a thing in her dream consuming her. This is more of the bats eat cats and I have much more to say about that. Um, like walrus eats oysters and she is dreaming uh, like the walrus and the carpenter eat the oysters. And she is also dreaming of him, they do suggest, each eclipsing the position of the other round and round and round as somewhat equals Alice and the Red King. Although that is ambiguous and they are playing with that. Dumb puts a saucepan on his head, which is now a helmet by position. Alice asks if it is going to rain. Dumb spreads a large umbrella and says it will not rain in the position under it. And they don't care if it rains outside the umbrella. They don't care about anybody not in their position. That's why they're sucking Alice into theirs. The umbrella is as sharp as a sword. Alice laughs, but actually given Chinese logic puzzles and other things, no, it is, but only at the tip. So it is as sharp as a sword. That's correct. But Alice laughs because of course it is only in one small position like underneath this umbrella. So one angry and red with fury, the other timid and white with fright. That's one more use of red and white. Like the red and white queens, they will prefigure. They agree to have a battle over a broken rattle, which goes back and forth, which like a corkscrew works by moving backwards and forwards. The battle is interrupted. 
not resolved by the black crow, which sends both brothers equally fleeing in fright. In the prior analytics, Aristotle says if A stands for crows and B for intelligent, then no A applies to B and vice versa, as no crows are intelligent and no intelligent things are crows. I actually think crows have some intelligence. Uh, regardless of Aristotle, that would make the black crow ignorance if it is in tune with, and why then do the deceitful dumb and deflee flee because they are scared again of anything they are ignorant of outside of their position that comes at them unless they try to incorporate Alice. I do compare this to Poe's Raven, in fact, and wonder if Carol was inspired by the author he did uh, admire in part. In the next chapter, the White Queen remembers what happens both ways in time. Here again with the chapter break, we're immediately presented with the next category. Acts like a child, says her shawl is out of temper. She actually does say her shawl is out of temper right where we would meet the caterpillar in the last tale. And he asks her to keep her temper and they look at each other for some time in the opening words. And the white queen does not see a problem with jam days other than today. That's probably because she's time herself and it would, it's sort of strangely available to her. Or she would not think about it. The Latin pun on iam and jam is about now and future and past tenses. I am not the uh, speaker of Latin, but that would also have to do with time. Um, Eric, one minute. Okay, so Alice believes, uh, so taking more time and Alice and effort won't help. So the queen says she simply needs practice. Sometimes she believes in six impossible things before breakfast. I am being told I only have a minute. I actually timed this out and thought that I had more. Um, that being said, again, I will offer longer versions of this talk. Um, and yes, I, uh, well, yes, all is all right. Um, so essentially, um, to summarize the rest of what I have here, and again, I will have chance to give this more at length, um, there is much actually in the, the white queen turning into the sheep that suggests place and the shop and things receding out of place. In the next chapter, Humpty Dumpty is poor at relations. The, Alice says, of all the unsatisfactory people I ever met. In the next chapter, the White King sends all of his horses and men. But again, with all of this, everyone is overacting and over, uh, it's rather than poor underacting, overacting, poor in quality. In the next chapter, the White Knight produces an endless abundance and quantity of ideas, although useless. In the next chapter, Alice finds a golden crown on her head between the red and white queens. She's asked to do sums, but not with quantities, with substances. And cutting a, a bread and a dog uh, losing a bone. And again, um, because I only have this minute, or perhaps I have it no more, I will simply say, and again, I will, uh, to conclude this talk, I do believe, and I have further notes and uh, we'll give further talks for the playlist I've supplied the society and others, that the hunting of the snark is a logic problem um, such that the bellman boots, bonnet maker, barrister, broker, billiard maker, banker, beaver, butcher, and baker are all beings that all correspond to a particular category of Aristotle, um, such that the bellman is time, the boots is place, the maker of bonnets and hoods for birth and death is position, the barrister who dreams, dreams of a pig on trial like the pig in the duchess's house is relations, the broker who values his quality, the billiard maker who chalks his nose as action, the banker who writes a check for England as state, the beaver who paces on the deck and knits lace as passion, the butcher who carves things up, dresses too formally and teaches the beaver sums his quantity, and the baker who bakes bride's cake, wears too many layers, is roused by muffins, mustards, and jams, forgets his, forgets his specific name, cannot lie, is substance, which Carol seems to think vanishes with mortality, but that there is something golden beyond, but cannot speak of. So just to conclude again, I'm sure I've spent my minute already, but I do believe that Aristotle, uh, the central idea of the four forms of proposition, and I will simply say, I will leave this off to other talks, but the four forms of proposition are positive, uh, all none, some, and some not. I will simply say I do believe the white rabbit is overly inclusive in particular, some and some. The duchess is overly exclusive in particular, some and some not. The queen of hearts is overly exclusive in general, uh, all, none off with their head. And the king of hearts is overly inclusive in general, including all conflicting evidence. 
This goes back and forth with male and female, et cetera, interestingly enough for Carol. And I do believe that this lines up again with the four red and white queens and kings. And I think the reason the Duchess isn't in that uh, final illustration in Wonderland in a kind of square of opposition is Carol himself says, you do not need some not if you have all none and some. And the king, the queen and the rabbit remain in Wonderland and the Duchess is gone because she is not necessary. I think that that is uh, what's going on. I will leave again, I've already run out of time. I will leave to other talks, um, which I hope to do many other talks on Carol and Wittgenstein. In fact, that is my primary interest that uh, Aristotle says red is aggressive in people, white is timid, he uses black as ignorance, and balance is golden. Uh, I don't know that Aristotle uses gold as balance, but gold is balanced, so those colors actually, other than gold, respond, uh, correspond to Aristotle's uses, and gold is balance of ethics, the golden afternoon, and the summer sea of the snark. So that said, I would like to thank Giuliano, Gardner, Bartley, Bernstein, uh, Morgan, and my family, friends, and students for continued, and I hope for all of us, patience and perspective. So I will, my apologies for rushing through the end. I did actually time it and thought I had enough time, but I will make uh, videos on YouTube detailing all of this for you. So that said, hopefully you find some of that convincing and I am very interested in what others have to say. I am sure some disagree, but I would of course like to know how. So much happiness, and that is, again, what I have come up with, and I hope others come up with more uh, contradictory-wise myself. So thank you for all of that. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you for wishing us all happiness. I think we can all use a little bit of that uh, a year and a, however many days into a, into a pandemic. So, so thank you. Um, I wanted to, so first of all, folks, if please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, if you would like, direct message them to me to try to make sure that I can spot them. Otherwise, we do have folks uh, looking for questions in the chat since we do have quite a number of people um, on with us. So I wanted to um, jump back to Diane. Uh, first of all, just to kick us off, um, I had a question um, to get us going. Um, Diane, you mentioned uh, earlier on in your in your talk at, at sort of Carol assessing uh, so, so these photographs as failing um, in various ways. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the aesthetic criteria were that they might have used to sort of judge each other's photographs. Oh, um, um, perhaps I didn't explain that well enough, but by failing, I think what they literally mean is that they didn't get a photograph, um, that the chemicals that they were using failed, you know, so they just weren't able to make an image. Um, and there are a number of mentions of this kind of thing in Carol's diaries where he says, oh, you know, oh, I, at one point he experiments with some spoiled collodion. I think he's just trying it out. Um, but in those first years, it seems pretty clear that they're still kind of figuring out how to use the photographic chemicals. So when he says they failed, he didn't mean that they failed aesthetically. He literally means that they tried to make a photograph, you know, and just they didn't get an image. Okay, thank you, thank you. That that obviously makes sense. Um, uh, so he was talking about failing at a sort of more mechanical level there, I guess. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and then just one other thing that, that struck me, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the idea of what they did to communicate masculinity or maybe manliness, as you said in quotes, is, is a better way of, of explaining that. I thought that was a fascinating, how they embody, tried to embody that in the photographs. Yeah, so I mean, that was just kind of a gloss on uh, my very long chapter on this subject in the book that I published last year. Um, but it's really about, I think, this combination of the kind of system that the boys were living under that I've sort of mentioned very briefly. Um, you know, this is a time when the schools, they start instituting, um, they have houses where all the boys live together. They start instituting this um, system where the older boys are looking after the younger boys. The masters are always surveilling the young, the boys. Um, so they're sort of, it, it had been true that in the public school before that the boys had a lot of free time and it, and it, it ended up um, it's shifting so that the boys time was pretty much always um, accounted for. So they were always being put into activities um, they were always being um, overlooked by either their peers or by the masters. And so, um, and, and the purpose of that was tied to these ideas about manliness, um, Christian manliness, 
And um, it was all about sort of inculcating like this healthy body, healthy mind kind of idea um, and making them f- good future citizens. So I, my, my argument is very much that what the boys, this environment that the boys are in is they're being looked at, they're supposed to look at their older boys and also the masters as the examples of what they're supposed to strive to achieve. And because they're always under this sort of system of, um, of, of surveillance, and I, and I don't necessarily mean surveillance in a, in a bad way, um, that they're taking, they're internalizing these ideas in their bodies. And I think that Carol was um, very, was posing the boys and um, deliberately capturing that idea. And, you know, very much in the sense that he himself is kind of looking at the boys, you know, through the camera lens that are posing on the other, uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the camera, um, you know, as um, sort of what he himself had been, you know, and, and he's he's quite, he's young at the time that he's doing this. He's in his mid to late twenties, you know, so he's not that far removed from the system himself. You know, he's clo- he's got all these friends who are taking part in these transformations at the boys public schools like Kitchen. There's some other friends of his that are teaching at some of these boys, um, these boys schools too. Um, so I think it's very much, um, you know, a part of his, um, his, his life at that point. And so he's seeing these boys as a sort of mirror of himself as a young, a young boy, but I think he's also deliberately positioning them. So, you know, he's, he's trying to show this kind of manliness that they're learning. And he even remarks in his diary a couple of times, he, he mentions a few of the boys, like that he really admired them for their, their manliness. Um, you know, there are these really one you know, young manly boys, um, and you do see a little bit of a difference between the way that he's photographing these boys at the school um, versus the uh, all the various photographs that he's doing of, of girls um, at the time that you know are in the home environment. Great, thank you very much. I also want to. There's a question in the chat um, about the diagnostic photos from the asylum patients. Um, oh, uh-huh. Are more of those publicly available online or public in publications? Hmm, um, I. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I'm pretty sure there is a book on, on, on Dr. Diamond, uh, Diamond's photographs. Um, I don't know if Roger Taylor's still here. I'm sure he would be able to say as well. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, and there certainly have been things written from, written, um, on Diamond's photographs. There's also a, a good article by Francisco Colt in the Journal of Victorian Culture, I think, um, from a few years ago about Diamond and Sethi and Carol. And then uh, someone also was asking, what kind of what camera did did, did he use to take his photos, and, and was there a possibility of of folks constructing their own cameras then? Um, I mean, people could make their own cameras, but by this point in the mid eighteen fifties, you know, there's there's already quite a robust um, you know commercial uh, um, you know manufacturing of cameras and equipment and so on. And so um, Carol buys his photograph, sorry, buys his camera at at a, a store in London. He gets a particular he gets a particular kind called, called an Ottawill camera, um, you know, and it takes a certain size of negatives, um, and uh, that that's what he used. I don't think we know what Suthi was using, but he was probably using a pretty similar one. Okay, thank you, um, Eric. You have a question. If you've ever considered the wasp in the in, in the a wasp in a wig um, incident episode, and and which how does that sort of fit into your sort of scheme of of Aristotle's categories? You know, that's actually a very, that is a very good question, because at first I was trying to line up the categories with the 12 chapters as 10, and I definitely know that the wasp and the wig and that that was cut is something that people could bring up as something that potentially sits in the way of the theory. My best thought is that the final parts of the book, that that comes, of both books, I think according to the theory I have, is that the wasp of the wig comes in the part with absence and substance and air and absence, substance, and then Alice learning she is a queen and that she has position unlike the wasp. I actually have neglected going over the wasp carefully for my theory. Um, that is a part, I have several loose ends, of course. That is one of those loose ends. Um, I'm happy to admit, of course, you know, uh, but yes, the wasp and the wig is an interesting bit of a monkey wrench. But again, I do think the theory stands even if that were in it and it isn't. So it ain't, so that's logic, you know. But yes, um, that is, uh, that's a good point to bring up. And actually that's a good one to bring up as a problem with the theory. 
It is. Well, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I, well, we are at 11.25, so I do want to keep us on time. We have a few questions we didn't get to, so I just want to remind folks that there will be, after the next uh, couple presentations, we will have a social time at lunch, so maybe if folks are online, they can um, continue the, their discussions uh, during that period.